Good afternoon, good morning, and good night, depending on the part of day you are calling in from. Um, thank you for attending our webinar on how hidden influencers can drive culture change. Uh, we are really, really excited to have such a global audience. My name is Zhuzhana, and um, I'm the head of marketing at Maven 7, and I will be your host throughout the event. Our speakers today include Anders Vicek, co-founder and head of research at Maven 7, and acknowledged change management consultant, Mike Clare. Andres is a work and organizational psychologist, and he's the brain behind research and product development within Maven 7. He is a management consultant and a trainer specialized in social and organizational network analysis. Mike is a president and founder of Omega Z Advisors. He helps leaders navigate organizational cultures and office politics to deliver the change they actually want, be it process improvement, IT implementations, mergers, acquisitions, and consolidations, or high growth strategies. So the webinar itself will take approximately 60 minutes. We definitely want to keep the event as interactive as possible, so please do not hesitate to present your questions in the chat section or by clicking on the raise hand icon. We will also actually have a Q&A &A session at the very end, so, so all of your questions will be answered publicly then. And then, Andras, are you ready? Let's get started. Thank you, Zhuzha. Thank you for the introduction. What I would like to talk about today is the role of hidden influencers in change management and leading uh, change processes. First, I want to share an example uh, of our, which has been done by our research team at Alta University. They are, they are a scientific academic um, group of, of, of people who do some really cutting edge um, studies on social network analysis. And one of their studies was how flock of pigeons, you know, get home, find their way, and their main question was who is actually leading the flock. What they did is they put miniature GPS receivers into backpacks and put it on actual pigeons and put them down in a certain place and watched and, and collected data on how they found their way home. On the left side of the screen, you can see and you can track how they were actually moving. And this is where they started from. And this is the place they actually have to get to. As you can see along the way, they get a bit lost, but somehow they find their way back on the right path. Uh, analyzing the data um, helped them to identify a hidden hierarchy between the pigeons, which actually showed that what was visible, which seemed that there's the yellow pigeon who, who, who seems to be you know, in front a lot of the time, in a lot of the cases, um, meant that probably the yellow pigeon is leading the, the flock in the right direction. On the other hand, what turned out is actually the yellow pigeon was the one who took them on the, on the wrong track and made them you know, to get lost. And the data also showed that the yellow pigeon constantly goes back, observes how the red pigeon is flying, into which direction, then goes in front again and leads that direction, making it seem that he is actually leading the flock. Why this is, this is really interesting is that this shows that in some cases, in communities, in nature, you will have hidden influencers who might not be that visible to others, but they are actually leading the way, leading the direction of the whole community. Okay. <clears throat> One other important fact that I would like to share with you is how behavior patter uh, patterns spread through human networks. A lot of research in social studies actually showed that behaviors such as quitting, smoking, or even you know, emotional moods, emotional states, or uh, obesity 
all are influenced by your social connections through people who you trust, through people you follow, the behaviors they take on, whether it's quitting, you know, putting down the cigarette, that will have an impact on, on, on your life and the way you behave. What this means, what this actually means, you know, for, for organizations is that you have to be aware that people are actually influ influencing each other. But what actually happens is that companies tend to focus more on the formal side of communication. Whenever something is changing, you know, be it um, going, moving to a new office or, you know, implementing a new IT system or having a new strategy or a new organizational structure, what management and, and you know, HR typically does is send out formal messages to people. It can be newsletters, it can be the CEO, you know, presenting some of these new concepts and new strategies. It can be internet related communication or, or any system generated messages, but it's always focus on these formal channels. And, and what is typically neglected are the informal channels. When people during their daily work get connected, are influencing each other, and are exchanging information about the changes. What, this, what does this mean um, in another perspective? Typically, you know, what we would consider as formal communication is top-down communication. When management, decision makers are sharing information and data about what is going to happen, why it is going to happen, how is it going to happen. This goes down through the levels of hierarchy, top management sharing it with middle management, going down to supervisors and team lead roles. But on the other hand, what is typically the, the other side of the story, whether they are actually listening to people are people in the, on the lowest employee level actually sharing their feelings, their, their um, ideas about the change, what, what they, they think will happen? Are they asking questions? Do they receive uh, the answers to those questions? This part is typically um, neglected. And what this generates in organizations is a lot of peer-to-peer -peer communication around changes. How would you call that? Of course, gossips. People don't have the, the access to, to, to the higher level managers. They don't really know what's going to happen. So they start to discuss things between themselves, which of course generates another round of, of emotions and generates new questions. And, and it's, it's, it's sort of like an endless um, cycle. And why this is, this is really important is we have to know that changes always generate emotions. What happens when something is changing is that they're taking away something from you and they're also giving you something new. They're taking away something that you were used to. Maybe it was your office space and you're moving to a new office or maybe it was your existing IT system that you were using. But anyway, they're just taking it away, giving you something new which might be better, but anyway, it will generate emotions. These are the typical emotional phases that people go through in times of change. I think you must be, or you might be familiar with uh, this type of emotional curve. First of all, you know, you might experience a, a denial. You're denying that anything is going to change. Then you might become really frustrated or angry. Why is this happening? Then you start bargaining, like, can I, can I do something differently and it, the change won't affect my way of doing things? When you realize that it's going to happen anyway, then you become, of course, depressed. And if you experience signs that actually this new IT system um, is really easy to use and it will save you time and, and actually you will be, you will have some time to do other things, then you will see the, the um, some new new opportunities coming to you and at the end of the, the cycle you have the acceptance and why this whole why we bought this concept here when we're talking about networks is because 
it's very important to understand that when things are changing and these emotions come up, people are not only um, interested in receiving more and more and more information through formal channels, they want to discuss what is going to happen. So what they do is they turn to people who they trust, who, they, who are their trusted advisors, who they believe can help them, who they trust to ask questions. And what happens if management and companies don't focus on informal channels is actually very similar to this example that I'm sharing with you right now. This happened at a large multinational organization when the head of HR sent out two messages through email, through their newsletter to everyone in their company. First one that was that they're moving to a new office. The second message was actually that in two weeks time was that they're going to send away 20 people from the, the company. I don't know if you can you know, guess how people try to combine these two sets of information. But actually what happened was people believed that these two pieces of information are somehow connected. And the way they put the puzzle together is probably the management didn't make the right decision, didn't have the right information or was really stupid enough to rent an office where they don't have enough space for everyone in the organization. So that's why they have to actually fire 20 people. Of course, in, in the actual case, this, it, it, it didn't have any connection. I mean, they were not moving to a new office uh, and they, because they, um, they didn't have enough um, space, it was because they, they, they were moving to a new location to actually work together with other parts of the, other parts of the organization. So this is one, one typical thing that happens if you use form, only formal channels. People will try to put together information on their peer-to-peer -peer level networks and it won't really make any sense. That's why you have to understand who the influencers are in these communities, involve them, and try to have discussions with them. How, how you can do that, we have a very you know, easy to use online tool interface where you can ask people to nominate others within the community for different types of, of uh, connections, like which of your colleagues do you turn to for professional advice, but it can be um, related to trust, it can be related to decision making, and, and all these types of connections that are important in a change related process. They select names from the community um, in, in, in a questionnaire and why it's important to identify people with this peer nomination uh, process is typically when we're talking about change agents, the, the most standard way of doing it is you ask managers to nominate people. What happens in this case is that uh, the people who you select or the manager selects as a change agent will perceive the, the task of becoming a change agent as an additional workload, which is coming from the manager like, okay, please participate in this and that project. So this will add on to your work hours and I hope you're happy about it, of course, but you, know, you should do this. Uh, on the other hand, when we, we're doing this um, peer nomination process, it's actually involving everyone in the company to help find people who can represent you in the company as someone who will voice, put voice to, to your thoughts, your, your feelings about the changes and also ask questions in your name and come back with all the information through through these informal uh, channels. And of course, because, because people have nominated, the whole community have nominated uh, these change agents, they will be fully engaged, very, very em feeling empowered to, to represent people in the, in the community. An example of you know, what the difference is of information flow around changes in a community 
Here, what you see is actually an net, informal network of change-related communication within an organization. On the left side, you see the orange nodes are highlighted who are the top management members. On the right side, you see the identified key opinion leaders coming out from the survey. It's the same organization, but we're highlighting different people. And we basically model what happens if they share information about changes in this network. If they share the information about the change with their direct contacts who, who actually you know, are following them, then you see people become orange, the people who have been reached with this information. You can see on the left side that, you know, just really a few people um, have been reached through the top management members, while on the right side you see that almost three times as many people in this community have already have access to this information through the key opinion leaders um, through these informal channels. And of course, it goes on the step in, second steps and it even evolves even more. So generally, what we can see is that influencers reach significantly more employees than management does in these informal networks, of course. Um, that is not actually, I wouldn't say that that's a problem. That's a fact because typically top management members are more focused on their external uh, channels, like their clients, external uh, shareholders, their owners, the, 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 the policy makers, and also they don't have to be involved in daily operative work. They have to focus on the strategy, of course. But to know who those people are on the right side, where actually communication can be accelerated through of course, is an informal, important information which helps to helps you as a manager to be able to control information flow. Okay, so now we would like to ask you a question. You will be able to select on the screen what you think about uh, this topic. The question is, which change agents do you think are more motivated and accepted by their peers? Please select one of the following. Those nominated by management, those nominated by their colleagues, or both equally. Please select one. And uh, while you're in the process of making the selections, we are collecting the, the data, looking into how these uh, percentages are changing. Actually, we are already we already have 85% of the votes, which is great. So thank you. If you if you still have time and you're still here, please make your um, selection now. Okay, we we will be closing it now. And here is the result. So the question was, which change agents do you think are more motivated and accepted by their peers? Uh, it seems that 84% of all of you participants are saying that the, 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 the colleagues who have been uh, nominated by their peers are, are the ones who are more motivated and more accepted. But still, 16% say that both are equally um, important and, and engaged uh, in these types of uh, processes. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answers. Um, OK, but the question is, who are your hidden influencers and what type of influencers we should be looking for? In our model, we have two types of influencers that we are looking for. First, one dimension is, of course, people with a high level of connectivity who have social connectivity in their community. The other dimension is some professional capabilities, how acknowledged they are. Are they innovative? Are they good problem solvers? They, they might not have a lot of connections in the networks, 
the people acknowledge them as having some sort of capability, expertise that is important for the change. We will talk about this um, in the next slides. So people with high level of uh, social connectivity, we call them the connectors who are connecting others within the, within the community. And people with high level of professional capabilities, we call experts. Of course, there's the sweet spot, which is really exciting, who are both experts, have, you know, accept, who are acknowledged experts um, in the community and also have a lot of connections. We call these mavens, people with high level of expertise and a lot of connections. Of course, they, they are the first community that we, we are targeting and trying to identify in times of change because they will be the most important. What are the capabilities we are looking for? First of all, we want people who can communicate really well. Once we know, you know, and we agree what are the steps of a change, what is going to happen, why it is going to happen, and we are on the same page with them, it's important to ha get help from them to communicate with uh, others in the uh, company. One other, of course, aspect is the interpersonal skills. We're looking for people who have high level of trust and who can build a high level of trust with others, really social, really empathic, really understanding, and can connect with people very well. Another role is what we're looking for is people who can lead change, who people follow, who can lead the direction, like we saw in the example of the pigeons, who will be either in front or who will show the direction that people will follow them. And another important characteristics, which is of course related to leadership, is the capability of mobilization, how they can give energy to others, how they can inspire and get people on the move and make them um, go into a certain direction. And one, one aspect which is, I would say, it's, 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 it's more of an um, um, attitude, which is what you call change readiness, how people are open to changes. Are they ready for it? Are they able to adapt to change? And how much they are actually looking for change? All these capabilities add up to the profiles of the change agents that we are looking for, who will help us to drive a really successful change process. And I would, at the last part of my presentation, I would like to share two case studies. First, the first one is about al aligning different cultures during a merge project, merge process. What happened is there were five different IT companies with 1,500 employees. What they were really focusing on is they wanted um, to have less customer and employee turnover, to have people you know, motivated, looking, being, feel, feeling uh, engaged, and having everyone client focused, and to build a shared culture in, in, in this um, merge of, of these five companies. And of course, innovations are always important for these IT companies. What, what we did and what the process was is that we identified change agents in all of these five different uh, companies. And um, what they had to do, I don't know whether you're familiar with the appreciative inquiry methodology, is they had to go back to their own communities, do interviews with, with them, and try to identify what they think about what is the positive side of working at their own company, what are their values they want to bring into the new um, big merged organization. And what came out from it is that at the end of the process, the last step was building one community out of the change agents who were coming from the different companies. So these were the dreams. They basically proposed 31 different actions uh, with project leaders 
um, ranging from, from the common uh, IT um, related uh, developments to, to, to more of a um, team building and, and motivation related projects. But at the end of the whole process, you know, it was 31 proposed actions and project. That seems to be a lot in 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 in, in, a, in a change process. But actually, over half of these projects finished in in the first um, three months. So they were really happy. And when they looked at the KPIs, which were the number of customers who who were um, churn, churning, leaving the the company, and the number of uh, people from their staff who were leaving, then they were really happy because they had to find out that they're actually, the numbers were really small, so there were not too, too many people. The, the turnover was really, really small. The other project was also interesting, which was, which was more about behavioral, behavioral change. This, I don't know whether you use any um, sort of um, ERP system, but in this case, this was a real estate management um, company where they implemented SAP one year earlier prior to our um, study. And uh, what happened is that they still used their existing ERP system, which was very basic tool, but everyone knew how to use it. Everyone knew how to put in the data, how to generate the reports. So they were still using their own you know, previous system, but because the international headquarters of the company actually put into policy that they have to start using SAP, they also started to duplicate the work and also started to use SAP beside their own existing ERP system. <coughs> Sorry. And um, at a certain point, the international headquarters realized that the data that was in SAP and the reports that they were generating was not useful at all. There was not, not all data was in it. They were missing the deadlines with the reports. So there were some really, really crucial points with their financial reports and so on. And the management of the international company came back to them and said, look, you have six months to implement SAP properly, or otherwise we will change the management. So then the management of the organization became really, really motivated. They became motivated to do something about this case. They wanted to know who are the people who, who people use as SAP knowledge drivers and, and who are the people who are influencing behaviors around SAP usage? In this network, what you can see is one question, which was, which of your colleagues do you believe have the most reliable knowledge concerning using SAP? Um, the, error, the Each node here indicates an employee. Um, the lines have arrows pointing to a person that they nominated for this question. So the more incoming arrows mean more people ask, you know, concerning that person to have reliable or uh, actually turn to for advice concerning SAP. And uh, what the colors mean is another information. The blue nodes are the, actually the staff of the company who are on uh, payroll. The red nodes, like here are some as well, are the people who are external SAP consultants hired by, hired by and paid by the company to help others with SAP related problems. And uh, the green ones who we indicated are the ones who most people acknowledge as having the most expertise with SAP in the company. If you look at this network, what will be quite transparent is that, first of all, you have two, two experts where people are actually acknowledging that they have a lot of expertise related to, to SAP. 
and also a lot of people are asking about the how they can use SAP. So that's a good that's the good news. On the other hand, uh, what you can see is you have one, two, three, four, of or five of the SAP external consultants who are basically not embedded at all in this network and not sharing information, not used while the company is actually paying for them. While these experts here who are really central, they seem to be very, very overloaded. Too many people coming to them. Actually, this person was not an SAP consultant, so uh, he was trying to do his own job. And, but beside that, of course, try to help others. So at a certain point, he was really burned out because he wasn't able to do his own job. And when they realized this, they, they said, you know, SAP is really important for us nowadays. So they changed his workload and his job role so that one half of his time he could focus on SAP related internal consultation. Also, we, we, they pinpointed and they started to train other people um, who seem to be at least open to, to, to answer questions of the people related to SAP to get to a higher level, to be able to, to, to help others within the community. And one other thing that they did, because of course the, us the, uh, the usage of a new IT system is again a behavioral change, is they looked at who are the people in the networks who are actually um, important for influencing others within the community. Here what you can see is the network coming from the question through informal channels from which of your colleagues do you most quickly gain information concerning company news or organizational changes? On the top, you see the, the top management people. To the left, below it, you have the middle management members. On, on the left side at the bottom, you see the external SAP consultants. And the big circle of nodes are the employees. You can see that there's a lot of information flow between uh, these hierarchy levels, which is good news. On the other hand, um, we could pinpoint who are the top influencers in this uh, network from the employee level, not only from this question, but also from the questions related to communication, leadership, mobilizing capabilities, interpersonal skills, and change readiness, who they could actually involve in why it is to have them sit down with the management and explain to them you know, why they, the company really has to change to SAP, let go of the old existing system. Of course, there were a lot of real tough discussions with them on why they didn't believe SAP would work for their uh, company. But then they really managed to, to highlight the advantages that the system will have for them and also um, help them help others to, to understand um, this whole SAP related implementation or change uh, process. Yeah, and uh, basically that, that those are my thoughts. I think at the end we'll still have time for uh, questions related to my topic, but now I would pass it on to, to Mike Lair, and um, he will talk about how network mapping can complement our leadership in culture change. And I would pass it on to you, Mike, now. Okay, thank you, Andres. Uh, you clearly laid out how we can begin to see and measure uh, the, the relationships in our organizations with network mapping. It's, it's just further proof to me that we're in the midst of a human data revolution, finding out more and more about what our people are doing in our companies. Uh, it helps us, obviously, to find the hidden influencers. Uh, understanding these relationships, I believe, is critical to our leadership in culture change. It's also critical to our leadership in any change. Uh, if what, uh, what I'd like to do is just try to position my remarks relative to Andres's. And that is if uh, what Andres covered is the forest, I'm going to dive down into the trees. The big question is, once we have this information, 
how do we apply it at the ground level, uh, at the team level, at the interpersonal level? And uh, Zhuzha, uh, there we go. Uh, what I begin with a discussion is like, I like to review what I call the change paradox. I came across this as people would ask me, you know, when is the best time to change, Mike? Uh, when I would answer this, I would get blank stares. Uh, what they really wanted me to answer was this question, when is the e easiest time to change? Uh, the problem is that the easiest time to get people to change isn't really the best. And that is because it's during a crisis. And the last time, uh, the last thing you want to do is being is really trying to change when you're in a crisis mode. You tend to not make your best decisions, uh, your resources are limited, and the, you know, it just, unfortunately, it's just not the best time. Um, the best time to change is also the hardest, and that's when business is good, and so many times, uh, you just run into organizations where things are just running so well, it's like they just don't want to change anything, but yet that's the best time to change, but it's the hardest. Uh, people always say, hey, we've got this figured out. We know how to run this business. We found, I even had one client say, you know, we found the money machine. <laughs> but I like military history, and I find that many of the upsets came about because leaders uh, were too confident we're too overconfident. That is, that's what's called hubris. What I like to remind folks is that many businesses have gone out of business or have become shadows of themselves shortly after having their best year. Even our hearts make one last stab at beating before they stop. I also like to highlight the fact that the hottest part of the day is when the sun is going down. So what I try to emphasize are to kick this off, two key strategies, and this fits perfectly into network mapping. Uh, they help us overcome what I'll review with you is the four major mistakes we make when driving culture change as leaders. The first is that it doesn't take many people to drive change. And I think Andres's comments about network mapping and, and finding these hidden influencers prove just that. Uh, the thing about the, the geese or the ducks, whatever animal that was, is, is a perfect example. A passionate minority will always overcome a dispassionate majority. And research will show that only about 5 to 10 percent of a group is needed to convert the whole group. The key thing is to get them collaborating and organized, and that's why the diagram there is really what you're looking at, and, and Andres emphasized this, is you're looking for your top collaborators, the people that work across the silos, not your top performers who tend to work in the silos. In fact, your top performers often tend to be some of your biggest resistors to change because they're performing real well the way things are. Why change things? So. What Andres was, show, Andres was showing was how to mobilize and coordinate these people, and that is a very important part of it. And the strategies that he was uh, emphasizing, and that's where uh, the relationships, the next part of this strategy is emphasizing these relationships, and that's where you take the forest approach that Andres was showing you and diving down into the interpersonal relationships because that is the most powerful way to get people to change is the relationships. And by emphasizing those relationships, and sometimes it's just a matter of, of asking. And what I try to uh, remind people is that when we talk about leadership, leadership is really about change. The root word lead implies movement from one spot to another. That is change. So unless you can change and move your people through change, you're really not a leader. Um, now, I'm going to go through four common mistakes that tend to happen and tend to thwart people's change, uh, efforts to change. And the problem, the problem is that these will retard our strategy, and I will review these four, and then I'll be asking you to poll on which one you've seen the most. So be thinking about these as we go through this. 
The first one is being too self-centered. And here this means that we believe we represent change. So therefore, we do not have to change. And what I try to emphasize to people is you really cannot change the behavior of others if you do not change how you work with them. It's sort of like delivering a brand new product in the same old packaging that you've done before. You've got to change how you approach people, especially when you're trying to navigate them through change. The next part is that we tend to rely too much on vision, strategies, and processes. That only gets us 40% there. And as Andres discussed, we tend to rely on the formal ways of communicating. And that's where the vision, strategies, and processes come into play. To play, and as he showed, we neglect the informal ones. Change, especially culture change, is again about relationships. Culture and relationships make mincemeat out of these other things. Culture change is about the heart. Emotion is called that because it elicits motion. That means change. Logic does not sway people, emotions do. That is why any change effort is largely a psychological one when it comes to these relationships. Now the next one is that this is very simply biting off more than we can chew. Uh, this easily happens when people are good at what they do or people are comfortable with the change. They will tend to overestimate the ability of others to adapt the change. Uh, they'll tend to think that people are just light switches that you flip on and off. Oh, we want them to change, so we flip them on and they'll change, make the change that we want. This is why it's necessary to break the change down often into smaller parts. And I use the example of a culture change. Suppose you have a very self-interested culture in which incentives are very much based upon individual performance and you're trying to move to a more team-oriented culture. That may be too big of a jump, so maybe in between you establish and work towards a culture that is more collaborative. The fourth uh, mistake is that often there's a strategic plan that a company spent thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars to have made. Uh, it's one that has maybe 10, 15, 20, 25 objectives in it. As a result, no one really remembers what the heck needs to be done, or they only remember certain parts. For example, on employee surveys, it is common to ask something like, how clear is the company's business strategy? Well, that's easy, easy to answer yes. The problem is that everybody thinks the strategy is something different. That's why it needs to be focused on a few things. People can only remember and focus on three to five things at most. What we do, and that's why we often tend to forget to uh, apply the same business principles to our employees that we apply to clients. We would not bombard clients with 25 different things. We try to focus on maybe two, three, four things. Uh, and that's why I usually, in terms of the communication of change, I focus on three key attributes you wish to change in a culture. And this will work, as we will see. What I'd like to do now is poll you on these four uh, mistakes. Air, uh, common mistakes in change. Again, it's too self-centered. You know, people who are advocating the change believe that they're already the ones who have changed. Maybe too rational. It's too focused on the mission statements, the strategies, and the visions, the processes. Uh, it's not enough on the relationships. Too much. Maybe it's just trying to make too big of a step, or perhaps too complex. People don't really understand the change that's being proposed because there's so many objectives surrounding it. So if you would go ahead and uh, take your pick on one of those four, that'll be uh, quite helpful to us and others. And as we see, uh, Probably too self-centered was the least, but too rational, too much, and too complex were about even, uh, pretty common. So I appreciate your input on this poll. Uh, I found uh, Andresh's, uh, the results of Andresh's polls quite uh, fascinating. Um,
Okay, what I like to focus here is a visualization. This represents the typical change effort companies attempt. They try to move on all fronts. They throw basic business strategies that they apply to their clients out the window when it comes to their employees. This is a waste, this is a waste of energy, money, and time. You typically see this as an example when we roll out training to everyone. We've got to try to change everyone at once. What we don't realize is we only need to at least focus on the key five to ten percent which network mapping uh, helps us identify. The five uh, strategic steps in change that I try to focus on, this is, is, these follow a basic project management template. The problem is doing these steps because, first of all, we tend to overestimate where we are. We tend to overestimate where we want to be. We underestimate the amount of change needed. We underestimate the time that we need. And then we overestimate how much change we can handle at one time. And this is where we fall into the traps of those four uh, common mistakes. So what I, I like to do is try to emphasize a communication strategy that's going to help you move through a culture change. Now, in very large corporations, they have a department totally devoted to internal communications. Very few companies, though, give much thought as to how they will communicate change to their people. And this is something that Andres addressed briefly in his networking uh, mapping segment about communication. Now, this is a process to help you arrive at three to four key words that represents the major attributes you wish to change in your culture. So I generally have people start out with about 20 different adjectives that would describe the culture that they would want. We then uh, sort them by similarity until there are three or four groups. We then find a representative name for each group, sort of a category name. We then come up with a powerful key word for each name, for each attribute. These form the three to four key attributes we wish to see in culture. Uh, we emphasize these attributes in all our communications whenever we can. This can be in formal communications, informal communications. So, for instance, if we were trying to emphasize teamwork as an attribute, then when we saw one of our people or, or so forth in our communications, part of the challenges in terms of presenting a new uh, goal or objective is that this is going to help us work better as a team. So in your communications, you're emphasizing these uh, key words. Now what we're doing is changing that all, trying to move on all fronts to something like this where we have breakthroughs through certain points. And if we pick the right key words, this works very much like a military strategy. You cannot move an, uh, an enemy, in this case the status quo on all fronts. You have to attack and focus your resources on a few key points to achieve that breakthrough. And then if you find the right things, it's sort of like a tree branching off. It's going to automatically shoot up with its main trunk and then branch off and cover some of these other, some of these other key attributes that you mentioned in the other 20 adjectives will naturally come into play and cover that. So once we have this, the next job challenge is an internal relationship strategy. This is where we take a look at our job and we try to identify three to four actions that represent each of the attributes that we picked. So if you have three attributes and you identify three actions for each, you'll end up with about nine, ten different actions. These are the actions you want to try to focus on a regular basis. Now remember that thing about being too self-centered, too focused on change for other people. Well, this is where we're showing people that we are attempting change, that we are representing change. They see these things and we emphasize what we're doing. And that's where you have to do that communication and sort of sales, ensuring that others know that you're doing them. We then help change influences or direct our reports to do the same. And again, this is where you take the information from the network mapping that Andres shared with you and you focus on some of these change influencers and you try to make them a top priority in your communications. This can be across silos, they can be within your silo and whenever you see them do uh, something 
that represents these attributes, you reward, you thank them, you recognize their actions, and you use these key attributes as the tool to do that and hone in. This is no different than what a political campaign, an advertising campaign does to promote their product or themselves. This is the same thing. This is why I say that businesses tend to um, tend to avoid applying the same business principles to their employees uh, that they typically apply to their markets and their clients. Now, the next follow-up is that you ensure your reports or some of these other people are doing the same process. You have them identify the uh, key attributes and some of the key actions, and you run them through that step. So how network mapping helps us and complements this is that it helps us identify the clients that are most likely to you know, accept the change initially and influence change with others. And this is something that Andres really emphasized a lot and hit, hit home on this. Now, this now gives us a, a chance to sum up you know, how network mapping helps. The, the research shows that when you have something as uncertain as change, the best decisions arise from a good interaction of computer modeling, such as network mapping and human input. This is assuming, of course, that people are willing to accept and integrate the data from network mapping. But this is what it helps you identify. It can also help you identify the kind of rewards that people might like. And sometimes it's just a matter of saying thank you to somebody and knowing that they know that you know what they're doing and that they're trying to pursue this change. So this is what uh, really just totally sums up exactly what uh, network mapping can help us do. It's a perfect complement to the data that we collect with the observations that we have. So now as we apply this to the diagram, returning to this, we emphasize three key attributes and we target our change agents first. This doesn't mean we neglect other people who do these things, but we've got to charge and, and, and target these change agents because of what Andres has showed, that they have tremendous informal influence throughout the organization. This is the, what I like to say, this is where people begin to complain about the grapevine and they don't like the grapevine and some of the things that happens with it, but this is what you're actually doing. You're making the grapevine work for you. You're leveraging it. These are people that may be looking for opportunities. Uh, they may be bored with their jobs and looking for some, a different. They may feel as though they're, they've been cramped in. They're not, their talents aren't being fully uh, expressed. And this is where Andres emphasized the change readiness. in his part of the presentation. So I'm going to turn it over back over to Andres to uh, wrap it up. And again, the thing is that we focus on a few people, we work on relationships, and we avoid these four mistakes. So those are my three key words to you. Yeah, th thank you so much, Mike. It was really inspiring. And um, as you were talking, you know, I, I just, you know, wanted to share that of course, it would be so great if every CEO of, the, of a company could sit down with everyone in the company and have some coffees with them and go into really in-depth discussions uh, around what's go why a certain change is happening and, and how that change is going to influence the life of that um, employee. But of course, that's impossible. Too many people, um, you know, imagine companies with, you know, ten thousands, thousands of people. Um, on the other hand, if you know who those people are, who who you can put extra resources into and 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 involve them more in times times of change, you will see that those behaviors and those values that are important in these processes will spread in through these networks. And uh, you will you will be able to identify these hidden influencers through these types of network mapping. And also, I think something that is 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 important that the way the way um, you map networks through peer nomination involves people. It makes them really engaged and motivated. This will help the, to spread this type of information in these networks. Um, and 
I, I love the way you know you you Mike you you presented you know how you can actually manage these types of influencers to to have your strategy in in internal communication and also managing the the relationships throughout the the change process. So it's really it really has to be of course an integrated process with all the other um, key steps that you you define. But if you do all of this and involve the people and, and involve the influencers, you empower them, then we're really sure that you will have a successful and accelerated change process. Thank you, Mike, and thank you all for participating. And I would give it back to you, Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thanks, Mike and Andras, again. Great, great insights and, and tips on identifying, involving and empowering um, your hidden influencers. So um, this is the time to now ask questions, if you have any. Um, we've already received uh, some, so um, I will start with those. Um, all right, so let's see. Um, Anno was asking if we can link Lean Six Sigma uh, to change management. If we can link if we, yeah. Six Sigma to change management? Yeah. Well, I, I would, yes. Yeah. Okay, you go ahead, Andres. Okay, I, I would just um, focus on how we can link um, the involvement of change agent, identified influencers um, with lean management. For instance, we had projects where the company was implementing um, the lean management you know uh, processes and uh, because they had like 5,000 people they wanted to start from people who will be actually um, spreading the, the behaviors that are really crucial for 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 the lean uh, perspective so they involved our influencers who were really on the top of first of all being having a lot of good capabilities and innovative ideas for um, how to make processes leaner. And also they were the ones who were actually um, spreading the word throughout to their colleagues. Okay. Yes, I would, I would just say, yes, you can integrate it. Uh, I think too, we have to keep in mind though that a lot of companies, they don't need a Six Sigma approach. Sometimes a Two Sigma or Three Sigma will, will get a pretty dramatic change for them. <laughs> um, next question by Peter do you use just one question that you showed to identify the key opinion leaders this is uh, for Andras no we actually have a set of 17 questions around all ga um, gathered into different categories around communication leadership change readiness and interpersonal skills and mobilization so we have 17 different questions to, to map these. Mm -hmm. Another question from Barry. How do you introduce the organization map to an organization where the purpose is to identify change agents? How clear does the nature of the change have to be at the time that the org mapper survey is being introduced? Um, well, it's, it's it typically it's important whether the, actually the company wants to use information from the network visualizations themselves because in some cases they're only interested in the list of influencers. In other cases, if they want to see whether um, people, for instance, in different locations are actually communicating with each other and how the different, are there silos in communication around changes, then of course we, we show the, the networks, but without the names. Yes, I would agree with Andres that there's many different ways you can do this. I, I would probably advocate trying to do this even before you even think about the kind of change strategy you wish to adopt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... The next question is, how can we ensure the effectiveness of this approach in very large organizations where there are multiple levels? Yeah, Mike, do you want to? 
Yes. I think the key is, is and, and even if you go back to some of the points I mentioned in the slide about the communications, this is where you need to work on the, the, the team or the change influencers that are going to help you and trying to get those organized. That's where uh, the mobilization that Andres talked about is extremely important. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that the biggest challenge is that uh, most times what companies do when they start struggling with change is they focus on alignment. That means getting everybody on the same page. And if you go back to that uh, slide I had about the collaborators and the top performers, that's one of the one of the the myths about executing around a strategy that exists. That it's not so much the people within the silo that are giving you the problems. It's communication across the silos, and that's where you have to connect and coordinate people. So this may be even maybe in, in uh, creating informal, uh, maybe committee structures that a, a large organization has that has different members from different uh, silos on them, different departments. That could be a source of, of people for you. But again, it begins with the network mapping to identify who the people are in each of these silos that can help you, and then it's a matter of mobilizing them. And that's how you do that, and then you pursue some of the communication strategies that I outlined. But it is tough. It's going to, take, uh, it's going to be a much tougher thing to change an organization with 40,000 people in it than uh, one with 40 people in it. But still, it boils down to you've got to identify those 5 to 10%. It only takes a few. Yeah, and, and actually, the larger the organization, the, the tougher it is to actually um, identify these people who, you know, as Mike said, you really still need um, to, to drive your change. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Vanessa here is asking if this system, uh, if this is a system that is licensed to other change agents, like software, or is it something else? How can someone use it to help their clients? So Vanessa here is a consultant. Yeah, it's it's um, basically we have Change Mapper um, as an online tool which we can provide to people who are working in organizations or with organizations as consultants to to identify these um, change agents through an online um, survey tool where you can set up the questionnaire, send out the invitation, and it generates these lists and helps you to filter it according to certain um, attributes. Okay. Um, David asks, how do you deal with works uh, councils, example, in Germany, who don't allow this kind of statistical mapping, uh, social network analysis for privacy reasons. Asking people who do you trust is a delicate question or taboo in some cultural contexts. Yeah, actually we had several um, projects where we were working for um, German owned uh, companies and we had to sit down with the, uh, with, the, the, with the trade union and the, the, the councils, work councils to discuss you know, what is going to happen, why it's going to happen. And sometimes they might even take out a few questions which are too um, sensitive for that community. But you know, a lot of questions are around who do you turn to for advice, who do you reach out in the, during your work, who, who is a good problem solver, um, who, so all these types of connections which are not about trust. So if, if trust is, is too sensitive, then you know, we can take that out, although we don't recommend because actually um, trust is really important in, in, in times of change. And we only, and one important thing is that once we identify influencers in, 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 the, in the online system, um, we send out an invitation to them whether they actually want to be visible to, to the management or to the consultant so they can still, they have the opportunity to opt out and say, no, I don't want to um, take part in any change uh, process. So they're actually controlling their own data this way. Yeah. Um, also, also yeah. I've worked in situations where um, clients may allow me as a consultant to have that information confidentially and not make it, uh, not release it to them. So that's another way 
that it can be done. So I'm the one advising them of the change and what to do, but I'm not necessarily giving them all the evidence that I've collected through, let's say, network mapping or other sources uh, to give them that kind of advice. Mm -hmm. Lisandro is asking, what background information do I need to feed into the system to do a network analysis? Yeah, it's um, basically you need a, a list of the participants and their main attributes, such as their department, their hierarchy level, location, and uh, their email address where you can send out the invitations to. Okay. And are there any risks of identifying the wrong people, meaning informal leaders that might be against the change? Again, Lissandro's question. Well, I, I wouldn't say that they are wrong people. <laughs> I mean, it's really it's sometimes even more important to involve the, the opposition, so people who are against the change, because they will be the ones, if they have a large network, they will be influencing people in a negative way. And if you can have them on board and explain to them what might be the advantages for them, and you can turn their mindset then they will be your biggest ambassadors, and it would be really bad to miss out on that. Right. Yes, and, and I would agree with Andres on that, is that sometimes uh, what it shows, it helps everybody with change. If there's some people who are advocating the um, other side or opposition to change, and there's various techniques that you can do on an interpersonal level to help people become more comfortable with that change and actually have them become very strong advocates of the change, as Andres has suggested. So, but those are that those things. There are things that you can do on an interpersonal level to help that. But yes, it's important to have even people who are against the change on some of these things, especially if they're heavy influencers. Thank you, Mike. Um, it seems we don't have any more questions. Um, so, in, in case no one else has another question, then thank you again for participating, everyone, in today's uh, change management webinar. And as, as uh, previously promised, we will send all of you the, uh, a follow-up email with the content and the recorded audio of this event. So, um, hope to see all of you again soon. And if you were to have any other questions, then obviously feel free to contact us either via our website or on Twitter. You can see the Twitter handles for both uh, Mike and, and uh, OrgMapper. And uh, we definitely look forward to speaking to you and, and, um, and having you again in the future. So thank you, everyone.